Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, we are really excited um, to all be together online and virtually today, um, especially given the, the context we all find ourselves in. Um, I think everyone who will be attending has been uh, in some way affected by the COVID-19 virus. So it's wonderful that we can continue sharing knowledge and information uh, in a virtual format. Uh, and we are really looking forward to this webinar. Um, this is our 10th webinar in the local and subnational government information webinar series. Um, and before I introduce myself and get started, I just would like to say that the webinar will be recorded and the recording will be made available to everyone who uh, registered. And this webinar will take place uh, twice today. So in this time slot and then again at 3 p.m. Uh, South Africa Standard Time or GMT plus two. Um, and I just want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone and really thank you for joining us and for, for being on the line. Um, we have a really exciting webinar today. Uh, before I start, let me introduce uh, myself. I am Timothy Blatch uh, from Eccles Cities Biodiversity Centre, um, based in Cape Town in Eccles Africa's office. Uh, I am the Programme Coordinator for Cities with Nature, and I work very closely on the post-2020 advocacy with Eccles uh, Cities Biodiversity team. So looking to today's webinar, uh, we are going to, as we know, we've had a, a few in-person events that have taken place already this year, and we will be reflecting on those uh, events. Uh, and the, the primary one that we will be looking at is the, the second meeting of the Open-Ended Working Group. Um, so we, we've got some exciting panelists on the line who are going to be uh, giving some reflections there, and I'll introduce them in a second. Um, and also an event that took place in Sao Paulo in February, very soon after our previous webinar, actually. And there were some exciting outcomes from there. Um, so without further ado, uh, again, just to really welcome everyone and to, to say that even those who have registered, um, we, we will be making the recording as well as any documents or resources that are mentioned on the call. We will make these available afterwards. Um, there are two ways that you can ask questions and get involved. At the end, we are going to open the floor for a discussion. Um, and so we, we kindly ask that you wait until uh, that point, at which time you can either raise your hand uh, using the panel on the right, um, and we will acknowledge uh, that question, or you're welcome to type your question directly into the chat box. Um, but as I've said, at the end of the webinar, we will open it for discussion whereby anyone can uh, can actually speak. So this is a slide that just shows in a nutshell the, the it, it situates the work we're doing in a, a much broader context uh, around the various processes that have led us to 2020 and those that will follow. Um, and as I say, this slide will be made available. Um, it shows how 2020 is is this critical year. And I know that with all the uncertainty going on, we are so confident and certain that uh, that we will, in the next year or so, see a, a really strong uh, New Deal for nature that will guide our implementation in the coming decade. So without further ado, let me introduce our, our panelists. I've already said I'm Timothy Blatch, a professional officer at ICLE. Uh, and we're really excited to have uh, Ingrid with us today. Um, she's no stranger to these webinars. Um, I think she's featured in almost all of them. And Ingrid has had an amazing career in uh, biodiversity, nature-based solutions, natural resource management. She's worked at various levels of government um, and has a vast experience in environmental law, um, as well as uh, running many of the, the projects at ICLE Africa and ICLE Cities Biodiversity Center. Ingrid is a senior manager um, for biodiversity and nature-based solutions, uh, as well as in the ICLE CBC. Um, so Ingrid, welcome, and we really, uh, we're delighted to have you on the line. We are also uh, very thrilled to have Harriet Balkeley with us today. And again, she's also no stranger to this process. She has uh, very kindly availed herself a few times before for these webinars. And it's always fantastic to, to hear her perspectives and to have her with us. 
Um, so Harriet Holtz joined appointments as professor uh, in the Department of Geography at Durham University, um, as well as Utrecht University. Um, and Harriet also has a very incredible career. I'm going to keep it brief because, um, but she, you know, many accolades. Um, and Harriet is currently coordinating the H2020 Naturevation Project, which is examining the role of urban innovation with nature-based solutions for sustainable development. Um, and Harriet's also the co-investigator uh, investigator on the H2020 Reinvent Project, which is examining the political and financial challenges of decarbonization. Um, Harriet is very active in both the biodiversity and climate space. Um, and Harriet, we are thrilled to have you with us today and to hear some of your insights and uh, reflections on the meetings that have taken place. Um, so thank, thank you for joining us. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Great. So in terms of the agenda for today, um, I've pretty much covered point one. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ingrid just now, who will give some feedback on the Sao Paulo event, the Bio 2020 event from February that took place in Brazil. Um, and then we're going to turn to the, the, the focus of today, which is really on feedback from the second meeting of the Open-Ended Working Group. Um, and Ingrid will provide an overview of that process um, and how, uh, how the event was structured and will include uh, an overview of the statements that were made by our constituency um, and through our, our network of partners. Um, I will then hand over to Harriet, who will give uh, uh, her reflections on the, the second meeting of this group in light of the draft global framework um, and, and to give some of her insights on what this means for local and subnational governments. Harriet will also give a little bit uh, of thought to the way forward. Um, and before I hand back over to Ingrid, uh, who will cover um, situate us in the context around COVID-19 and give some thought to the revised timeline of events and roadmap. Um, thereafter, we'll open for questions and discussion, as I have mentioned. Um, I should just mention that ICLI is uh, the focal point to the CBD and other multilateral environmental agreements on behalf of the Global Task Force of Local and Regional Governments. Um, and I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity as well to direct you. We will send around the link to our uh, post-2020 uh, dedicated website uh, where you can find the, the full schedule of webinars for the year. And we encourage you to register for them, get them in your diaries now. Um, and as you can see on your screen, these are the dates that we uh, will hopefully remain unchanged, uh, seeing as though this virtual format seems to be working in this current time. Um, so this is the list of webinars, and as I said, we encourage you to please register and join us uh, along this process. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ingrid. Um, as I mentioned, she'll be giving some feedback on the open-ended working group and how the process unfolded, um, as well as how our local and subnational government constituency was represented at the meeting. Um, and, and give some overview of the various statements that were made. So Ingrid, thank you, and thanks for being with us, and over to you. Thank you very much, Tim, and greetings to everybody. Um, I'm also based in Cape Town, um, and I'm going to start, uh, we've got quite a full program today, so I'm going to start just by locating everybody on the timeline. Uh, you can see where the red, um, star is, and it just occurred to me that it does look rather like the COVID-19 um, symbol. Um, but I think the important thing is, as Tim said, is despite the fact that many of us are um, finding ourselves in lockdown or self-isolation or uh, social distancing arrangements, we are able to continue with the very important work that is being done through um, online platforms um, uh, such as, as uh, the webinar, but there's also a range of others. And I think the, the importance of these platforms going forward um, will become greater as we um, have to adjust to a new way of, of living. Um, so basically you can see that we've come quite a long way. Um, the past is, is really conflated. There's been a lot of meetings in the past, very important meetings. And we're now, um, in terms of the CBD process, we've just um, gone past the second open-ended working group. 
But you'll see on the right hand of the screen, there's also a lot of dots that are still green. In other words, these are the events that are forthcoming. And so there's a lot of um, negotiation and policy uh, development that still needs to take place. I can have the next slide, please. So the first one I want to talk about is a very important uh, meeting um, within the constituency of local and sub-national governments that was held um, earlier this year, but in the first week of February in Sao Paulo in Brazil. Um, and it's an important milestone because it, it represented a gathering of local and sub-national governments um, in Brazil, and it was very widely supported by the most um, prominent um, organizations working in the field of biodiversity conservation. You can see they are listed there. Um, and this event was hosted by um, ICLI South America, uh, the Sao Paulo State Government, Regions for Sustainable Development, um, as well as uh, the um, uh, post-2020 biodiversity a support project um, which is EU funded and which is being coordinated by Expertise France. And it was a really big event. At that stage, um, the, um, there were already many countries that were indicating that they were not keen on travel. So the initial plan was that we were going to have mayors and high level delegations from the Lusophone countries at the event, um, but we were not able to organize that. It did, however, still have, uh, there were more than 200 delegates, um, and these were uh, governors, mayors, heads of institutions from the different Brazilian territories, municipalities, uh, states, the metropolitan regions, as well as uh, um, biosphere reserves. Um, but there was also a very big contingency from um, the private sector represented at the event, there were academics, there were members or representatives of civil society, there was a very strong youth uh, um, uh, delegation and uh, traditional communities as well. And the idea of organizing this event was that it was to provide a platform to formulate um, and consolidate a Brazilian perspective on how local and sub-national governments should be, participate um, in the uh, post-2020 negotiations, but specifically also in the new global biodiversity framework. Next slide. Um, and one of the uh, major outcomes actually from this event was the um, adoption of uh, Carta de Sao Paulo, um, which is a, a letter or a charter or it's a declaration as it were coming from the um, the event, the Bio 2020 event, um, and it was signed by the Secretary for Infrastructure and Environment from Sao Paulo, uh, Sao Paulo State Government. And essentially what it did was um, it called for three um, major things. The first is for reinforcing multi-level integration into the post-2020 global biodiversity framework in very strong and clear terms. Um, and secondly, it has a very strong recommendation that the CBD parties revise the um, existing plan of action for local and sub-national governments that was adopted in 2010. And thirdly, it specifically also asks for an improved plan of action um, under the new global biodiversity framework that has a specific mechanism for local and sub-national government engagement. And you can see in the picture there to your right, um, those are the representatives um, from the major institutions um, and the Secretary um, for um, Infrastructure Environment, um, Mr. Pinedo, in the middle, holding up the signed declaration. Next slide. So another very important thing that happened at the um, Bio 2020 event was that the um, federal district, as well as the 26 state capital cities in Brazil and Sao Paulo state, um, they all committed to signing up to Cities of Nature. And the significance of this is that, um, as many of you will know, uh, Cities of Nature is endorsed by the Secretariat on the Convention of Biological Diversity as the official platform 
for cities and sub-national governments to share and report on their actions and commitments going forward in terms of the new biodiversity framework. And what happened at the um, event itself was that we had um, the Secretary for uh, Environment and Infrastructure signing up uh, on behalf of the state government, as well as um, about 15 of the capital cities that were represented at the meeting. And you can see they are all listed there. And, and the importance of this is that with this commitment, they are making it known globally that they also share um, their commitments around what they're going to do as city uh, and state governments to contribute to global and national objectives and targets um, in terms of uh, uh, you know, conserving biodiversity. Next slide, please. And with this, we move on to the next major event that's taken place this year. Um, and that was the second open-ended working group um, of the CBD. Now, you will remember last year, there was a, the first meeting which was held in Nairobi, and we have reported back on this in previous uh, webinars. So if you are interested, you can just go back and look at the recordings of that. Um, but the second one was, was meant to be held in, in um, Kunming in China. Um, obviously, because China being the host country for COP15 this year, it was, you know, it was significant to have it actually hosted by the host city. And unfortunately, um, because at that stage, um, the COVID virus was really um, spreading very rapidly in China, um, the United Nations um, and the CBD Secretariat um, had to move the event and that happened at very short notice and they moved it to, to Rome. Um, they found um, a, a suitable host um, venue in the FAO, which made their headquarters available. Um, so the meeting took place at the same time. Uh, it was scheduled initially for that last week of February, and it took place in that last week. And it was really important because this, um, in terms of the CBD process around um, the new global biodiversity framework. This was the first round of negotiations on the zero draft of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which had been made available uh, a couple of weeks earlier in the middle of January. Um, and so this was going to be then the first opportunity for CBD parties, as well as all of the other stakeholders to get their teeth into the, the content and the text um, of the proposed new framework. It was, given the fact that it was already at that stage, there were a lot of concerns about the spread of the virus, um, and there were already cases in other countries. It was a, a really large gathering. There were more than 700 delegates attending, um, 380 from the CBD parties, and then there were from non-parties, all of the UN specialized agencies, a huge contingency of intergovernmental organizations as well as NGOs, um, indigenous people and local communities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if, if you move on to the next slide, Tim, um, you will see that one of the, the important things is that the local and subnational government constituency was very, very well represented. Uh, we had for the first time, you can see in the photograph there on the right, we have our own, um, as it were, seat in the audience, um, specifically dedicated to subnational and local governments. Uh, we were given opportunity to make uh, representations. And the important thing is that um, all of the major networks were represented. So it was ICLE, um, Local Governments of Sustainability, um, the European Committee of Regions, um, as well as the Advisory Committee on Subnational Governments and Biodiversity. Uh, and this uh, advisory committee is com um, coordinated by Regions for Sustainable Development and the Government of Quebec. And then there were uh, also representatives from the group of leading subnational governments towards IT biodiversity targets. Now, unfortunately, in the picture, um, we have uh, represented the ICLE, um, the European Committee of Regions, and the Advisory Committee on Subnational Governments, but the um, representatives from the group of leading subnational governments toward IT biodiversity targets are not in the photograph. Um, however, what I wanted to say to you is um, 
the, the network of partners representing the local and sub-national government constituency worked very, very well together. We met every morning um, to plan and to coordinate our interventions and positions. We were obviously able to sit near each other, so we had a lot of contact with each other. And um, we coordinated how, you know, how we engaged with and, and lobbied with the CBD parties. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to say was that we were also very fortunate in having um, Harriet Balkley support us by providing us with technical support on um, what were the sort of issues and the discussions coming out of the meeting. It was a very complex meeting um, the program kept changing. Um, the, obviously the co-chairs were trying to come up with a format that would work for everybody. So they had relatively few plenary sessions compared to previous uh, negotiations and a lot of contact groups. Um, these contact groups worked well in some respects, uh, but in other respects they were quite limiting because the venues were much smaller, there weren't translation facilities, and there was a lot going on. So it was really useful to have someone like Harriet around who could help us track what were the issues coming out of the meetings, what were the sort of wordings, um, and where was the, the focus. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we made uh, three interventions. <clears throat> the first intervention was um, the opening plenary, um, which, um, and all three of these interventions, incidentally, had been pre-agreed to <clears throat> amongst the partners. And we, <clears throat> excuse me, we had also, <clears throat> sorry, we'd, we'd so, so we co-drafted these um, interventions and then we agreed in advance who was going to read on behalf of the local and sub-national government constituency. So in the opening intervention, what we did was we obviously reported on what we had done in the past and our commitments, etc. And then we made a very strong appeal to the parties not to reinvent the wheel, but to strengthen existing mechanisms to implement uh, previous commitments, um, as well as encouraging all levels of government to take uh, responsibility collectively. We made reference to the Singapore Index on Cities Biodiversity. We also made reference to the Cities of Nature and the new platform that we're currently developing, the Regions with Nature platforms, as being the place where governments, should, local and sub-national governments, should make their commitments. Um, and then the second uh, statement was read during the plenary on item four, and item four was the focus focused on the global biodiversity framework. And um, in this statement, obviously, um, what happened was we were focusing on the comments that our networks had submitted earlier in the year on the global biodiversity framework. Um, just summarizing the most salient points from those comments and talking specifically also around the implementation of the 20 action-oriented targets and how important it would be to capture and mainstream the contributions of the uh, local and sub-national governments in implementation. Um, and then the, the closing plenary was, um, which was held on the 29th of February, um, was um, at, the, at that stage, um, some of us had already left, um, but it, we did still have a relatively strong contingency at the uh, open-ended working group. So, and that focused essentially on um, just giving some positive feedback, and reflecting on the outcomes of the um, discussions at the open-ended working group, and specifically recognizing the inputs from the EU the UK, Japan, uh, Mexico, Singapore, and Argentina, which uh, you know recognised the, the contribution of local and subnational governments. Next slide. <clears throat> All right. So, um, I think the other really um, important thing about the Open Ended Working Group, while there were some. Um, some, there were some, not disappointments, but there was some uh, caution or um, reservations around the fact that um, many people felt that the negotiations were not 
moving as fast as they had wanted or hoped, um, that maybe the ambition wasn't quite high enough, that there wasn't enough clarity on what was meant by transformative change or actions, uh, that some of the targets were not strong enough, or um, et cetera. I think from the perspective of um, our constituency of local and sub-national governments, it was significant that although there were less parties in this round of negotiation compared to the first open-ended working group that recognized the uh, importance of participation of all levels of government in implementing the new framework, the, the contributions and, and the statements that were made by parties such as the EU, Japan, Mexico, the UK, Singapore, Argentina, were far more specific and clearer in what they were, what their expectations were, and what they were asking for or suggesting be taken up. So, for example, on uh, the Thursday, the 27th, um, in the fourth plenary session, which dealt with um, the, the proposals for tools, solutions, implementation, uh, enabling conditions, mainstreaming, responsibility, etc. Um, we saw that the United Kingdom proposed a new point um, um, which spe specifically speaks to all sub-national governments being enabled or included in the enabling conditions. And the sort of wording that they were suggesting was that the active involvement, um, and this is much stronger than you've seen previously where there were sort of uh, recommendations or, you know, we sort of support or whatever. This is specifically saying the active involvement of sub-national governments, cities and local authorities, um, and calling for a recognition on their devolved responsibilities for implementation of the framework. Um, clearly something which is stronger than we have seen before. Um, similarly, Japan called for involving relevant regional instruments, sub-national and local governments in implementation. And um, the EU, Singapore, Argentina, and Mexico made similar statements, all stressing the important role of um, the levels of all levels of subnational governments in implementation. Uh, if you can move to the next slide. And then um, on the uh, contact group four session, which focused specifically on tools and solutions for implementation and mainstreaming, which took place on the Friday, the 28th, um, we saw countries such as Canada, Argentina, and Mexico making statements specifically around Target 13. Now, Target 13 deals with um, mainstreaming of biodiversity values. It talks about uh, um, how these should be integrated into national lo and local planning processes. And um, there was a very lively discussion with a lot of parties um, coming up with proposals for specific text. Um, and the majority of these make reference to local and sub-national governments. Um, and then the, the uh, um, sort of culminating in the co-lead of the contact group asking parties to consider an amended wording, um, which talks about um, how the um, mainstreaming should, should cover all sectors of government. It should be inclusive um, and um, just reinforcing and strengthening the proposed wording and making it very clear that um, there's the sort of principle of multi-level governance um, in, cap captured in the, in the proposed text. Um, something else that took place on the uh, at the open ended working group um, was that the uh, there was a report from the um, uh, long term uh, from the informal advisory group on mainstreaming um, around the long term approach to mainstreaming and the parties recognised that um, the one of the goals and I'll talk about that a little later one of the goals is very similar to the the mainstreaming goal under um, target thirteen. And the parties recognized that um, mainstreaming should be um, support implementation and the concept of multi-level governance or all levels of, of government, including local and sub-national governments as being instrumental to ensuring mainstreaming um, was, you know, I think it's being increasingly recognized as a key priority for the global biodiversity framework. Next slide. 
And then um, on the Saturday, um, in the closing plenary, um, New Zealand, for example, um, also emphasised the need to involve sub-national and local governments um, in providing a roadmap for, for transformative actions. Um, I've just briefly referred to in my previous slide, the informal advisory group on biodiversity mainstreaming. Um, this group held a, a meeting of the members present um, on the Tuesday and then on the Wednesday there was an open meeting um, which was open to all stakeholders, to the CBD parties, um, and it was very well represented. We had a very small meeting room, but there were representatives from several parties, a strong contingency of NGOs, there were business sector representatives, youth, etc. Um, and um, it's, we, we specifically talked around how the long-term approach um, on mainstreaming is being developed and what are the key concepts and messages. Um, and I just want to emphasize that as far as mainstreaming is concerned, um, and you will re have um, reported in the past that I represent the local in Italy um, on the, the mainstreaming advisory group, um, as well as the wider constituency of local subnational governments is also represented through the extended um, consultative network. And as a result of the inputs that we have made, um, the whole concept of whole of government approach um, is very central to mainstreaming. Uh, there's a specific uh, goal uh, within the long-term approach to biodiversity mainstreaming that talks about um, national and local and sub-national planning, uh, development processes, et cetera. Um, and the, the fact that um, the reversing of biodiversity loss requires action from global to regional to sub-national, um, local and national levels are all very strong messages that are um, captured in the um, LTAM, the long-term approach to mainstreaming. So I think it's, it's, it's really um, important to understand that um, within the approach to mainstreaming, which parties are increasingly understanding is central to the new global biodiversity framework and to a more transformative approach, um, the, the role and the active participation of all levels of subnational government is really strongly embedded. Thank you. Next. Thank you. And that's the last of my slides. So I hand back to you, Tim. Great, thank you so much, Ingrid, and thanks for sharing with us uh, the Open Ended Working Group 2 process. Um, it's great to see our constituency coming together and the unity and, and collaborative nature of our work, um, as, and to see the network of partners um, really having a, a strong and united front, um, and to see the, the traction and momentum uh, being built. Uh, so just a few notes on some of the things that Ingrid mentioned. The the Carter from the Rio, uh, the event, the Bio 2020 event in Sao Paulo, we will share the link to that. Um, it's also available on our dedicated website, which we will also share a link to. Um, and I just want to take this opportunity quickly to welcome all of the capital cities that committed to joining Cities with Nature and really welcome them to the Cities with Nature family. Um, and extend the invitation to any other cities on this call uh, and really encourage you to, to join uh, and be part of this really exciting process at this very critical time. Um, and before I hand over to Harriet, it's maybe worth mentioning that we are in the process of really enhancing the Cities with Nature site. Um, and one of the, the ways we're doing that is the development of a dedicated commitment platform where cities will be able to commit to urban actions, set various targets, and that will form the basis of a monitoring and reporting system, which will all be facilitated on Cities with Nature. So I encourage uh, all, all cities, large and small, all regions, all sub-national governments to join us, to register on the platform, and to, to begin engaging and be part of the family. So thanks, Ingrid. Uh, we really appreciate your inputs. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Harriet, who I've already introduced and who uh, we are really excited to be working with on a number of different fronts. Uh, and Harriet is going to give us a little bit of her uh, insights and perspectives in terms of reflecting on the Open Ended Working Group 2 process, 
um, and where this sort of lead, leaves our constituency now uh, at this moment and going forward. So uh, Harriet has a few slides. Uh, we're we're going to uh, look at things around shifting the dial, uh, getting the action agenda up and running, as well as looking ahead to the process that will uh, come. So Harriet, thank you again for joining us and over to you. Thanks very much, Tim, and, and thanks, Ingrid, also for giving us such a, a great overview of the overall process. So, yeah, what I wanted to do is just um, share a little bit of my perspectives on on where we got to with the city's agenda at the end of the of the meeting in Rome. And um, next slide, please, Tim. Um, yeah, so so I've, I was thinking, well, how far over the last you know year have we come in terms of shifting the dial? thinking about the, the different roles that cities can play. Are we are we kind of heading towards some more kind of transformative role for cities in the post-2020 framework and what does that look like? So I've divided my comments into into three things here and then I'll, I'll move to thinking about what the action agenda, um, another aspect of the post-2020 framework might do, might it help us kind of move forward um, even further. So I think you know we can we can see that the diet is definitely shifting in terms of how cities, subnational governments more generally are kind of thought about in relationship to the biodiversity issue. I mean, if if historically we can say that for the majority of those involved in the conservation agenda, urbanization and cities in particular have been thought about as a kind of threat to biodiversity, encroaching on land near cities which has biodiversity value and converting that into urban land. Um, and now what's one of the most interesting things is that the sort of move away from just seeing th cities as a threat to biodiversity but actually as a space of opportunity for acting towards biodiversity goals. So we can see a growing interest in harnessing nature-based solutions. Of course, I'm particularly interested in that given my research background, and maybe I tend to be a little bit biased towards looking at that issue, but it's certainly something that was very prominent on the agenda at the open-ended working group and is being written into the new framework. So we can see nature-based solutions as um, being thought about as a way in which cities can implement action towards sustainable development goals but that also then achieve biodiversity targets as well um, and also I think an encouraging move towards thinking about urban space as also um, biodiverse space so an interest in urban parks and not just as kind of green space but perhaps something that we're all feeling even more now under the current conditions that those kind of urban spaces are critical means through which we connect with nature and, and when we're not able to do that we do really feel its absence and and certainly that kind of value of those urban spaces was increasingly thought about with a specific target for urban space in uh, urban green space being thought about in the new framework. So I, I think that you can really see that dial is shifting but I think one of the key things that the the convention and the framework and if you like the the narrative around it is still struggling with is how to show cities that biodiversity is an opportunity for them. So maybe biodiversity convention is increasingly thinking of cities as an opportunity for biodiversity but I think in order to really in galvanize and engage um, cities going forward we're going to need to show how acting on biodiversity really matters for kind of core urban business and there's ways of doing that but I'm not sure that we're there yet. I think in the second, uh, the second issue then is is this idea of moving from the margins to the mainstream. And Ingrid gave a really nice account of all of the different ways in which the kind of mainstreaming of local and subnational action was was talked about at the event. And so I don't need to go over those details for you, but just in terms of my own perspective, I think we see an increasing focus on multi-level governance. It's also one of the my own research interests and, and has been very effective in the climate change regime over the last 20 years in terms of creating the space for urban action. And I think it's an, a very important first step is that multi-level governance is regarded as a way in which biodiversity can be managed, can be governed. Um, and then we also saw lots of very specific kind of calls for cities to be involved in planning and in implementing action on the ground. Um, so I do think that that whole of government approach is really beginning to stick now and it will be vital for the actual success of the final convention. But again, I think there is you know, another step to take for the full potential of cities to be realized here, which is to recognize that cities and subnational governments aren't only 
implementers of policies and actions decided elsewhere. So they don't only translate that into planning frameworks and enforce them, but they come up with all sorts of different interventions, innovations, approaches to managing biodiversity themselves, which should also be able to find space as you know good mechanisms for governing biodiversity. So that I think we need, you know, the be like the self-governing part of cities and the way in which cities have multiple different capacities for governing has not yet fully been captured. And that's tr quite tricky to do within the confines of the legal agreement of the post-2020 framework. And that might be where the action agenda comes to be more important. I'll speak about that a bit later. And then this third aspect, and, and Ingrid also mentioned it, a sort of slight sense of disquiet really that perhaps the sort of promises that the post 2020 framework would deliver a kind of transformative agenda for biodiversity governance, the kind of agenda that was called for by the IPBES global assessment of the loss of nature and biodiversity that was released uh, in, around about a year ago now, um, which, which told us that we needed transformative change if we were going to uh, um, get to the kinds of outcomes that the biodiversity governance framework is trying to achieve. And here, I think the the convention and the convention process is struggling rather more. There still remains quite a focus on the direct impact of urbanization on biodiversity, but also on more generally on the direct drivers of biodiversity. And all the targets to address the indirect drivers, such as addressing pollution, thinking about production and consumption, are, and climate change are there. They are often the most controversial, they have the least consensus behind them, and they if there's a quite perhaps a question about how if the phrasing that's in there at the moment continues, they may remain rather lacking in teeth to kind of bite on those issues. Um, so while there was a growing role that a growing recognition that indirect drivers had to have a place within the framework. I think one of the most interesting things to me was that it was in those spaces that the cities element or the subnational element tended to fade out from view. So, for example, there's a target aimed at reducing pollution, and one of the aspects of that is, is waste and plastic pollution. But there was no mention by any party of the critical role, and in fact, the fundamental role that local government plays in managing waste and indeed plastic pollution on the ground. Local government, subnational government run pretty much everywhere are waste management systems, but that wasn't kind of considered in the discussion. So, so I think that you know, as the if the push towards more transformative change happens, it will be crucial that the role of cities and subnational governments gets considered as really central to addressing those indirect drivers. Next slide, please, Tim. And so this brings me to this kind of consideration of what goes by the name of the action agenda. And um, some of you may have heard about this before, and I'm sure that it's been discussed in this forum, that at the last, um, Conference of the Parties, which was held in Egypt um, yeah, a year and a half ago now, there was an idea to have this action agenda where the whole of society could make commitments um, towards biodiversity goals. And it was the idea that it would be a, a, on the road from Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt to Kunming this year, that this action agenda would gather momentum and collect the commitments of a whole host of different actors. And now that process seems to have been relatively slow to start from the Biodiversity Convention Secretariat. I mean, there is some platform where commitments can be made, but it hasn't really gathered much momentum yet. But what was really interesting about the meeting in Rome was that so many uh, non-state actors, and of course, all of the work that ICLI and its partners are doing, shows that the action agenda is very much alive and kicking. It's just perhaps um, rather uncoordinated at the moment. There's lots and lots of different initiatives happening business groups leading new initiatives for commitments, the finance sector having new commitments, of course, lots of different things happening in this space as well. And I suppose here the question is, how is this actually going to come together so that we can really account for um, and also build trust in all of these different kinds of commitments that are happening on the ground and whether they, you know, whether we can really make them add up to contribute to the, to the global goals for biodiversity. Uh, next slide, please, Tim. Yeah, so I mean, I think the action agenda potentially provides us with a really interesting place to try to address the sort of challenging times that we have at the moment. Um, 
you know, knowing that all of our different kinds of local conditions will be really changing a lot, I think alongside the kind of building commitments into the framework in the way that Ingrid and you know the, the coalition have been doing and so successfully, making sure that the action agenda provides a space where cities can, you know, in their different capacities and undergoing very different circumstances and conditions can make a commitment and can get on board with this agenda will also be important. And Tim mentioned that the Cities with Nature platform is seeking to go into that direction in the next few months as we develop a commitment platform there. And I think that will be a really critical part of getting this right. So, I think more than ever in the current circumstances, we're going to need to show that working on biodiversity is creating other kinds of opportunities for society and for our cities, um, and that we can capture that opportunity both through this new decision and this idea of you know, fully recognizing the role of subnational government and cities and local government in the convention, but also making sure that we have this kind of robust space in the action agenda to kind of harness the creativity and the innovation that cities can also bring. Uh, to this to this question. So yeah, so that's just a few reflections from me. I hope they're a useful perspective for the rest of you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Harriet. Um, it's always wonderful to have you join us and um, thank you for your your insights. Um, it's, it's, it is great to see the action agenda coming together and certainly the next few months will be critical as we galvanize this, this action going forward. So thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your input. Um, I realize that we are uh, running out of time. Um, it's amazing how fast an hour can go. Um, but I'm going to hand over back to Ingrid now just to talk about the way forward um, and how uh, the COVID-19 situation is a global pandemic is affecting the roadmap and timelines. Um, so Ingrid, over to you. Thank you. And if you can just move to the next slide, please, Tim. So I think one of the um, big things about COVID-19 is that it's not that we have derailed or stopped the negotiation process. It's just that um, these major events or, or milestone meetings and negotiations have been moved on for some months. So for example, you'll see that the um, SUBSTA meeting and the SBI meeting where they were going to be taking place now in May have been moved forward and they're going to be taking place in late um, August and the beginning of September. There's still a question mark around the IUCN World Con Congress, Conservation Congress, whether that's going to be taking place still in June. And likewise, the uh, CBD haven't come out with the final date yet for Open Ended Working Group 3. It will need to take place after the SABSTA meeting. And um, they're also still not have not confirmed the date of uh, the COP15. There has been some talk that it will be moved to early next year, but we haven't had final notice of that, and we will keep everybody informed. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, please. What I, what I do want to talk about is the uh, local and subnational um, workshop that the Government of Scotland is organising in collaboration with a whole host of partners. Um, including ourselves and the other members of our coalition and some others. Um, this was initially planned as a three-day event to take place in uh, Edinburgh from the 1st to the 3rd of April. Uh, it's no longer going to be held in that format, obviously. It is now being conceptualized as a series of webinars and consulta online consultations that will run for an extended period uh, from the middle of April right towards the middle of May. And you can see from this rather complicated diagram uh, to the on the left top, you'll see that the first consultation session will take place uh, in the week of 13 April. And essentially what that will do is to introduce the process for subnational authorities. Uh, it'll talk a bit about the post-2020 draft, the Edinburgh Declaration, which is the declaration that will that is intended to come out of the um, consultation process with local and subnational governments from, from the Government of Scotland's uh, perspective. The, uh, we will also talk about the subnational, the plan of action, the renewed plan of action. And uh, in order to make it easy for an online process, uh, these 
introductory sessions will be held within regional context because we have to cater for different time zones. So there's going to be one for the Africa region, one for the Asia region, for Europe and North America, and then for South America. Um, and these will then be complemented by a series of thematic webinars um, on the different topics you can see in the right hand top corner in the gray sort of green box uh, topics on nature-based solutions climate and biodiversity linkages monitoring and reporting tools capacity building resource mobilization etc these are being organized by uh, different partners um, and everybody's busy conceptualizing how to present these webinars and the idea is that running in parallel, you'll see the middle blue block, is that there will be um, an online format of the Zero Draft, the next version, the uh, Edinburgh Declaration, and the proposal. Ingrid, are you with us? Hello. We seem to have lost you for a few moments. Yeah. We can hear you now. You can continue. Okay. Okay. Um, I was just saying that the plan of action um, will be something that uh, we will present at the uh, consultation that the Scottish government is organising. Um, we propose to have a, we're busy with the review at the moment, which looks at the uh, history of what happened, what has been achieved. Uh, it, in the second part, it also looks at what the strengths and weaknesses of the current plan of action are. And in the third instance, what it does is it makes uh, recommendations for a renewed and stepped up plan of action in line with the new global biodiversity framework. This will be done through an online format and there will be an approximately four week period. Um, that will then lead into a process where the various um, responses will be collated, um, more or less from the middle of May till early June. And the idea is that there will be a second consultation session happening round about the middle of June to give feedback on what was the input coming from the uh, online consultative process on the Zero Draft, the Edinburgh Declaration, and the uh, renewed stepped-up plan of action, um, so that we can make the submissions on those things to the SBI meeting. Um, and as I said, the SBI meeting is going to be taking place in the first week of September. Um, and those um, three documents, or the, the, the feedback from the consultations, the online consultations on the uh, Global Biodiversity Framework, the Edinburgh Declaration, and the Stepped Up Plan of Action will then be tabled um, at the SBI3 meeting in Ottawa um, in the first week of September. And then from there, it'll feed into the rest of the process, open-ended working group, COP, etc. So that, in a nutshell, is how the process going forward will take place. Um, I think we've run out of time, and I had asked uh, um, both Tim and um, Harriet to talk a little bit about the thematic work webinars that they are planning, but I think given the limited time, we will I will just hand over back to Tim so that we can take a few questions before we have to wrap up. Thank you, Tim. Great, thank you, Ingrid. Um, thanks for taking us uh, through that process. Um, so I'm going to leave this on our screen as we open up for some discussion and questions. Just to mention our next webinar will take place on the 16th of April. The link to register is here as well as on our dedicated website uh, where the full schedule is available. And just to mention you can see in the top right corner um, hopefully a familiar picture of what our uh, dedicated website looks like. And just to make note that we are currently in the process of uh, completely revamping the website and, and coming up with a, a new and improved version, uh, the branding of which you can see at the bottom of the screen. 
uh, on local and subnational advocacy for nature and we will continue to post the updates and the roadmap and timeline etc on that uh, new website so at this point uh, I'd like to open up, uh, we do have limited time, but if there is are any burning questions, uh, just to note, you're welcome to contact us via email at any point. Um, but if there are any burning questions now, uh, I'd like to open the floor. Uh, if anyone would like to put their hand up, you can ask a question either in the chat box or by putting your hand up, we can then unmute you and uh, you can ask a question. So are there any questions at this time? Okay, um, with that, I think we can close the webinar. I just will close on a note uh, of again reiterating that a lot of the resources and documents that have been mentioned we will share in a follow up email as well as the recording of the session. Um, and there are some contact details here for uh, ICLE Cities Biodiversity Center. We encourage you to get in touch and to join us on this exciting journey and process. Um, and really encourage you to join our next webinar and all of the webinars in this series, um, as well as keep up to date with uh, what, uh, as the process unfolds. We are sending out monthly uh, email updates, um, which, uh, which in a nutshell provide the, the monthly update on the process. Um, and I just want to really take this opportunity to thank everyone in attendance on this webinar. Thank you for joining us today. As I mentioned, there's another time slot this afternoon, uh, 3 p.m. South Africa Standard Time or GMT plus two. Um, and we look forward to, uh, to being all together in the next webinar, if not later today. I'd like to also thank our panelists, uh, both Ingrid and Harriet. Thank you for your time, your insights, um, and for sharing uh, the amazing work that is happening. Um, we will also post some links to the work that Harriet is doing and Naturevation and some of their exciting tools that shortly we will have available on Cities with Nature. Um, but Harriet, just a huge thank you from us for joining us um, and thank you to everyone in attendance. We will be together next time in April. <laughs>